Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a Bald Explorer reading, a live reading on the Bald Explorer channel. And it's four o'clock here on the 29th of October 2020, and it's very nice to see you. I am back from my travels in my van. Um, we'll just give people a, a few moments to log in just to remember who I am and where I come from and all of that. Uh, there's been a slight panic here because I'm going to be reading this book, um, Lift Luck on Southern Roads by Edward Tickner Edwards, um, online. And I've got to read it off the computer here um, because I don't actually have a copy of it. So uh, please excuse that. I don't know how that's going to go. But there was a slight panic because I couldn't find it. Couldn't find the sodding link. And uh, I was like, where is it? Is it not online? Oh, my God, I'll have to find another book. I think we do have have it now. Um, I know that um, uh, Lee Lawson has a copy of it, but I don't have a copy here. Anyway, hello to TurboStream, Adrian. Lovely to meet you the other day and to do the videos. Uh, thank you very much for showing me around your van and for showing me up onto the Walton Hill. To uh, Philip Mary, good afternoon. I, n I haven't had a chance to get that jumper back to you, the uh, burgundy one, but I will do that probably tomorrow. Um, I just got in and I've been so busy since I left, but I'm wearing your blue one, which looks fantastic, and I've worn it whilst I was on my travels. Hello also to the lovely Julia, who I have yet to see uh, since uh, disappearing um, on my little travels. Uh, to Laura, to Graham, to James, uh, to Justin Jones. Um, Justine Jones, uh, just to let you know, I have received the book you sent me. It's in the other room. I meant to bring it in. Forgot. Panicking. Thank you very much for that. I look forward to reading it. Um, I meant to send you an email, uh, but I've been editing the minute I got in after cleaning the van and emptying the van and lighting the fire and this, that and the other. Uh, to Ed Loud, hello to you. Uh, to Deborah Warren, to Anne H, to Billabong O'Neill, to Mike Stevens, to Alan Sandell, Linda Kane, uh, who says, good to see you back safely. Yes, thank you very much. Um, lovely to meet you again, Richard. My pleasure indeed. Fantastic. And Poshing Ton Tono, is it? Tono One? Um, hello to you. Well, very, very welcome. So we're going to read this book. This is a bit of an experiment, really, to see if this works, uh, because normally I have the book in front of me, but I'm going to try and read it online this time. I do have a cup of coffee here to keep my whistle wet. So I don't know. Um, it's a book. I can't remember when it was written, but it's a similar sort of time, 1920s, 1930s, I think, something like that. Um, there is a, a preface, preface written by Tickner Edwards, but I'm not going to um, read that. So we'll just go straight into chapter one. Um, you're very welcome. Hope you enjoy it. Says Justine Jones. Thank you very much. I'm sure I will. I've got the others. The others are up, up on a shelf just up there. So chapter one is the. I don't know how you pronounce this. The Sirens, the Siren or Siren City. I break away at last on the North Road, the first lift, an old country inn, ruminations, bees and apples and the cider mill. In these old books, sometimes they, they, they set out, don't they, the, the themes of the chapter and that's what they are. There are Englishmen in Venice, so the story runs, who have been going home every month for 20 years back and have never gone yet. It has been next month, always next month, and so the months have lengthened into years and the years into decades, and still, head by the siren song of the sea, these happy exiles linger and drowse and dream in the sunshine, until, to their friends, there is palpably no other, no other going home for them but that long last going from which there is no return. Something of this sort happens, something of this sort commonly happens here in our own land to men of the hardy north and east who have been lured south westward 
to Torquay. The town lies in a pool of well-nigh unbroken sunshine, wedged in between a barrier of great rocky hills and the sea. Foreign-looking villas are dotted about everywhere in the greenery of the encircling heights. The fish keys with their, roll, with their rows of limes and sauntering crowds, the fussy little harbour, the straggling front ha house fronts, each painted of a different hue, are all undisguisedly continental. It is a bit like that in Torquay. I don't know if anybody's been to Torquay. Um, I want to carry on this sort of slight interruptions in the text as we do this because that makes it live. Somebody emailed me, by the way, and said, uh, oh, you do know that this is already recorded on Librivox or whatever it's called. I think it's an American outfit that um, records books in the public domain. And I've listened to them and they read them. They read them without error, but they don't always read them in an entertaining fashion. Sometimes they just read them quite monotone. Um, I haven't really listened to the person who's done this, so I've no idea. But the, the, somebody said, you know, it's already been done. But then I think well, probably somebody has read all these books um, at all the time. <clears throat> That's not the, the point of this, is to do it live and to look up on maps and, and that sort of thing. Uh, quick hello to uh, English Andy. Um, um, Mike Stevens, I don't know if I said that, Ed Loud, I can't remember that. Presto Wind, hello everybody. Uh, yes, it's very it's very windy at the moment, I can tell you that. Um, the English Riviera, yes, that's right, Torquay. I was in Torquay a month ago, lovely old town. Yes, and of course the famous uh, Faulty Towers was set in Torquay. Um, so, wh where are we? The Fish Keys, I've done that, the public... The public gardens might have been imported intact from any town on the Riviera. Palms and queer, exotic shrubs shadow the winding ways at every turn. Among the people, even among the well-to-do, there is a love of bright, ram ramiant, holy Italian in spirit. Bright ramiant. Ra ramiant? Raiment? Raiment. R-A-I-M-E-N-T. Going to come across some of these words that I don't know how to pronounce or spell. So uh, you can help me out by telling me what they mean. Um, but the most foreign of all is the climate, the soft, sleepy, indolent air of South Devon that pervades the whole place. You may bring to it the liveliest of energy. You may be the most earnest go-ahead soul that ever lamp-lighted through Cheapside or the Strand. But once you have settled down in Torquay, and the place has got its slothful golden grip upon you, it is goodbye to all your upstart aeroplaning moods. In a little while, you will have forgotten time and London, and London almost as completely as the gently stirring multitudes around you. To be in the sunshine and genially Sonomlently, sonomlently, it's a word to get your tongue round, happy with your cigarette. That will soon make up the sum of your convictions and your aspirations. To wander around the quays and watch the great timber barks unloading. To look at the empty and filling of the emptying and filling of the Torbay steamers, to marvel at the luxurious of the anchored, the luxuriousness of the anchored yachts, and the tranquil obs, ob, obesity, obesity. Well, I don't know why I didn't recognise that word, and the tranquil obesity of the fishermen. Leaning, lean over the harbour wall by the hour in a brown study, caught on the mesmeric scintillation of the water, or lounge the morning away listening to the band in any one of a hundred sheltered sunny nooks that look out over the blue satin floor of the bay. You will fall into the train of all these things naturally and unthinkingly, and will, at length, be no more inclined to break from the spell of them than the Anglo-Venetian from the spell of his city in the sea. It's probably very true. And I know, you know, they always say, that down there in Devon, they're all a bit slow, aren't they? Take things on a slower pace. 
think it would do us all good to take things on a slower pace these years. Even a hundred years ago, says Mike Stevens, palm trees flourish there. My sister lives very close, actually, to Torquay in... Um, oh, where, is she, where does she live? In... in um, oh, it's a sort of monk's place. Oh, what is it? Uh, Newton Abbott. There we are. I, I knew there was a monk in it. So it proved in my own case. I had come to Torquay in the blazing summertime, designing to let a month or so waste itself commendably in the easy Devonian way. But the summer had waned and set. Autumn had begun to burn in the far woodlands. October was well upon her way, and still the fascination of the place was upon me, held me. I was no more ready to go at this, the eleventh hour, than I was on that fair June morning when I had come to it, taking, as it were, a plunge fathoms deep into the Lethian sunshine of its thronging ways. Self-admonition, admonition, admonition, self-admonition had been self-admonition, that's when you tell yourself off, isn't it? Self, I can't, how do you pronounce it? Adm admonition, is that right? Self-admonition had been no good. It had been useless to upbraid the jolly hours here in the midst of them. The reproving mind is so easily diverted. Shush. i just check that in case that's me going... Uh, have I gone off air? No, I think we're still there. Are we still on? Admonition. There's a word for you. Hang on a minute. I've lost my, lost my space. No, no, we're still on. Sometimes I get a little message saying, oh, you've gone offline. Um, a slower pace indeed. That's why I make sourdough bread. Yes, it. I bet just made some bread. I came in and among all the other things I've done, I've just needed some dough. So how, how long? I haven't done sourdough. I've got to give that a whirl. Another area I have to visit. Only been on holiday to Devon once in 25 years. I must go to Devon. Now I've got my van. Um, I can follow in the footsteps of this chap. Still on air. Oh, good. Um, yes, so I was no more ready to go at this, the 11th hour, than I was on that fair morning when I had come to it, taking it, as it were, a plunge, fathoms deep into the Lethian sunshine of its thronging ways. Self-admonition admonition, admonition had been no good. It had been useless to upbraid the jolly hours here in the midst of them. The reproving mind is so easily diverted, especially if it happens to be your own and the object of its censure. But gradually the conviction dawned upon me that if I must go, as was indeed indisputable, the only way of it was to go on the spare of the moment, to launch out blindly, determinedly, on the next fishet of good resolution that should come rippling near my lazy feet. It was on the grey of an early morning in late October that the thing finally came to pass. In Torquay, where the dense leafage puts even far, fam, far famed Valambrosa to shame. Valambrosia. That's not um, cheese, is it? Or uh, yoghurt or whatever it is. Um, you can never sleep through sunshine. The thrushes and the robins besiege your window with battering rams of music until you rouse and listen, waiting, as you must if your desire is more slumber, for the quiet that comes only with the full of the day. But this time I saw the new writing on the wall with the first eye that contrived to open. It flashed upon me that my time was up at last and that today I was really going. In a moment, I was out of bed and dressing as if for a wager, not daring to consider plans too closely, least with them might come those temperate second thoughts that had hitherto always been my undoing. And within the hour, I was out and off through the level sunbeams of the morning, camera and pack on my shoulder, heading briskly northward with the long shadows of the tree trunks making a griddle of violet across the living amber of the deserted way. The north road out of Torquay is the seaside road. 
At that early hour, there was no one abroad but a stray milkman or two, a few yawning, rubbershod policemen, uh, and here and there a dissipated cat wending homeward in blear-eyed disillusionment of life, oblivious of sparrows and thinking only of the kitchen hearth and a full saucer of milk. Thus far, I had so triumphantly held to my first resolution against plan-making that I had absolutely no idea of what lay before me beyond the general scheme of winning out into the country and there, after breakfasting at some village inn, to get out my maps and squarely face the business over a quiet pipe. But as I gradually left the houses behind and the sun got higher and higher out of a calm, empty sea, there came back to me the scent of apple orchards and the ripe blackberries on the breeze. I got me a picture of the heart of the country, what it would be like now, in late autumn, when nobody goes to it holiday-making. What a pleasure and profit of a long rambling jaunt of foot through the country after country, going always by the bypaths and forgetting the very existence of towns and trains and politics, and trying for a real glimpse of the wild life of the countryside in autumn, and, incidentally, into the life of the English peasantry, taken out of season and therefore unawares. Sounds a bit like our um, Walter uh, Wilkinson, doesn't it? Going on the byways, out and about and avoiding the towns, um, which would be good. Alan Sandell says, must have had a bob or two to stay over there all summer. Yes, I imagine he must have done. Um, it's like all these authors, you know, you, you just can't actually picture how people really live these ways and also be able to write so beautifully. Um, they must have had a very good education. Um, so that's all good. The more I thought of the plan, the more it grew upon me. It built up in my mind, swift as the building of Aladdin's palace. Every second added a story. I had the battlements on and a brave flag flying from the topmost tower before I had gone another twenty paces. And then a sudden thought. I plucked the whole vast edifice up by the roots, demolished its foundations and had it firm on fresh new bearings, all in the space of a moment. For the sound of wheels had come up behind me and turning round I saw prophetically in the first of them the whole rumbling procession of my three score lifts. It was an old it was a wide, old-fashioned market cart, and in it sat a ruddy old woman, incredibly stout, and as she drew abreast of me at the foot of the hill, her horse dropped to a walking pace, and I gave her a good morning. "'Where to?' she asked, by way of a combined question and greeting. I had made a furtive inspection of the name and address on the cart shaft. Uh, uh, to Stoke in Tynehead, uh, Mrs Burrell, said I, trying my best to look tired and hot. She eyed me keenly, but very pleasantly, and then began to rummage down some empty potato sacks into a kind of seat beside her. Will ye ride? she asked, in a broad Devon tongue. Ye knows me better than I knows you, but tis, but tis so with great many of the new folks. Nah, not up here, up yon, not up, no, sorry, let me get this right. <laughs> um, ye knows me better than I knows you, tis, tis, but tis with so many of these new folks. No, not up there, up yonder, on top. Tis sore bit of collar work for this old horse. The old horse and I, therefore, trudged on side by side up the long slope, and at the crest of it I climbed on to the potato sacks. From there 
sorry, from here, there was a magnificent view, open view of the hilly coast, the jagged red sandstone cliffs looping away in a wide semicircle until the rosy peaks and curves with their green topping sank into the misty ultramarine. For miles ahead, the road followed the dips and curves of the seaside hills, a broad white ribbon here at hand, but dwindling into the finest silver thread where it vanished into the far-off valley of time. The old cart jogged and jolted and swung sideways on its crazy springs. The cart and the sacks on which I was perched were clogged through with their red, rich Devon soil, so at every jerk a fine dust rose about us. Mrs Burrell was powdered with it from head to foot, and I was soon no better. She looked round at me from time to time in a motherly, sympathetic way. "'Tis the worst of taters, tatties,' she observed. "'From first to last, from seeding to marketing, us be allers smothered with it. Poor Burrell then went, up, went off as... Sorry, I'm trying to read this because it's all written in the like the Devonshire drawl and it's not easy to read, see? "'Tis the worst of tatters,' she observed. "'From first to last, from seeding to marketing, us be allers smothered with it. Poor Burrell, when a went off, a were as red as Rena Renard, and there were no riding on it even then, but tis rare healthy for the windbreak folks say. She sighed, looked solemn for a decent interval, then lapsed again into her formal cheerful mood, upon which I hazard an inquiry. Does Stoke in Tynehead lie over there? I asked, pointing along the cliff road, for truth to tell I'd never heard of the place before. Nah, sure, tis right in land. Here us goes round here. Us goes round this bit here turning, see? And as the cart veered slowly round the lane, I stood up and looked behind me. There were certain phases of primitive human feeling from which no civilization can emancipate us. And among these stands that curious in instinct to sentimentalise when we are doing for the last time even the most ordinary everyday things. It had suddenly occurred to me that this would be my last view of the sea, for it might be many a day it may it might be a many a long day to come. So I stood up and looked backward, expecting to see myself instantly to the prey of all sorts of stereotype yearnings and regrets. Yet not the ghost of a sigh could I conjure up. I tried again and again, but it was no good. There lay the heavy, glittering plains of water that had been my boon companion for so many months past. A little chip of white sail shone like a butterfly's wing far out on the azure, and I told myself it might have been my own craft, and I, the happy voyager, on any other but this fatal day of farewell... Oh, sorry... A little chip of white sail shone like a butterfly's wing far out on the azure, and I told myself it might have been my own craft, and I, the happy, and I, the happy voyager, on any other but this fatal day of farewell. I probed my imagination... Oh, no, I didn't. I probed my imaginative vittles down to the midriff for collections of long, sweet, timeless trafficking on this nirvana of the deep. Days when the mackerel were in the bay and flickering silver was hauled up at every moment over the gunwale of the boat. Days when the little lithe sixteen-footer sped on tiptoe joyously through the seething lop of the brisk sou'wester breeze. And those most delicious times of all, waiting for the wind far out to sea when the sun burned in the cloudless sky and not a breath stirred over the glassy stillness of the water, when the sail hung limp and useless overhead, and below me the varnish bubbled in the seams. But it was no good. 
my Pegasus would not soar an inch. I turned back, saddened, to my potato sacks and found Mrs Burrell's blue slit of an eye fixed anxiously upon me. "'You're not hard up for a penny?' she inquired, after a moment's awkward silence. "'Tain't much of a living, grinding they things, and ye looks on common down jold and hungry like if I if it be as the habit of treasuring antiques in the shape of tweeds makes for personal comfort, but it has its inconveniences on the road. A good camera, however, will always save the situation. I hastened to extract the opulent looking thing from its well worn case and explained to Mrs. Burrell its uses in another art that than that which she had dedicated it. So I'm not quite sure what's going on, but I think she saw the camera and thought that that's how he made his money or something. As we jogged on together, talking of photography and potatoes, we came at length to Stoke in... until at length Stoke in Tynehead Weathercock shone before us, jaunty and golden over the tops of the trees. I parted company from her at her own house, a, sh a little short of the village, and went the rest of the way on foot. If I looked as hungry as I felt, I must have been an affecting it must have been I must have been an affecting sight indeed. The pure soft country air had made me ravenous, and I marched straight down the village street with eyes for nothing but bears and bulls and spotted cows and such like hospitable beasts. At last, an inn sign came into view. It swung from the gable end of a long, low, rambling house at a corner, with a thatch over it, green as a garden, and latticed windows giving, the back of, giving back the glow of the morning sun. The door stood open, and as I approached, a broom head kept popping in and out, each time driving a billow of dust into the sunshine of the tidy street. The young woman, who was the cause of all this dispersal of atoms, stopped in her work at the sight of me. She received my request in silence, then turned me a very dubious, troubled face. Breakfast? Well, I don't know. I I'm sure there's no in the houses, but... And then as an afterthought, but ye could make do... But could ye make do with heggs and bacon? Could I? I knew no words to express my readiness. Silently, gratefully, I followed her into the cosiest little parlour I had ever seen. The walls were of dark oak wainscoting. There were cases of stuffed birds hanging between frames of sporting pictures, varnished into brown, indecipherable obscurity. The chimney glass was wreathed in cut paper and of canary hue. A shining copper... There's a picture here. A photograph. I don't know that that's supposed to be the house, but I can't really show it to you. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the next line. Uh, a shining copper warming pan filled one corner, and in another an old grandfather clock ticked its drowsy, tranquil life away. Before the window lay the family Bible covered with a bead mat and surmounted by a vase of pallid wax flowers under a glass dome footed in red chenil. Chenil? 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 Is it chenil? Outside on the windowsill pots of geraniums made a barricade of scarlet and just above on a nail in the sunny wall hung a wicker cage with a blackbird in it a contented, optimistic bird that now dug his golden beak into a sprig of groundsel and now uplifted it in mellow, tuneful song, impossible to associate with dissatisfaction at his lot or any desire to be free. And while I sat contemplating all these good things, the lady of the besom went to and fro, each time adding some rich touch to the picture a snowy damson cloth to the old mahogany table, 
silverware and blue china, a steaming coffee mug, a homemade loaf, a bar of honey cascading golden tears. Then at last, the depreciated dish, the piece of resistance set in the midst of it all and giving forth, thank you, and giving forth an incense that was in itself the whole silent grace before the meal. When, an hour later, I, was take, I had taken the road again, fed, refreshed, the course of my prospective lift journey decided upon, the sun was already high above the hilltop and everything promised for a fair day. The plan I had sketched out was briefly this. I was going home, and for me, home meant Arundel in Sussex, 200 miles or so to the east. I was in no sort of hurry. I meant, therefore, to lay down no definite line of route, but merely to turn my face roughly eastward and keep moving, day after day, until such time as my luck and the rolling stock of the road should bring me to my journey's end. Now, here I was in mid-Devon. Between Devonshire and Sussex lay four other counties, to wit, Somerset, Dorset, Wiltshire and Hants. But Dorset lay along the coast and an essential part of my scheme was to get, as soon as possible, deep into the heart of the country. It was clear then that I must strike up north for the whole of the first day at least and face about to the rising sun only when I was sufficiently far from the sea. Thus, thus, strolling onward and turning the matter over in my mind, I soon left the village in my rear and found myself in the pleasant orchard country. The wind had died down to a merest breath, a vague somnambulist, I can never say that word, somnambulist wind, faintly aimlessly doddering about in the light blues of the day. Everywhere about me was the glow of apples, red, yellow and green, and in the hedgerows blackberries hung in drooping clusters, cooking in the heat. I soon came upon a gate of inviting presence, a gate venerably bright with lichens and conveniently broad in the beam. Obviously, this was the destined waiting place for my next lift, so I sat down filled a pipe and looked about me. Let's just pause there for a moment see how you're doing. Uh, it's taken me a bit of time to get into the rhythm of the writer and of course I've been mucking, mucking up my words as ever. It's interesting, I didn't know that he was heading to Arundel in Sussex. This will make it very interesting for those in Sussex. Uh, Bumper dumpers, not sure, toilet humour, not quite sure where you're going with all of that. Are you still out there and are we still on and are you still listening? It does look like you are, good. Um, so yes, it's very different reading it online, but the, the, text, I, the text is very strange. It's one of these books that's been scanned and I'm looking at the text and almost every other page... Well, I can show you. Let me show you. See if you see if this works. Hang on. Let me switch to this. So I'm reading the text here, but one page is like that. The other page is like that. So one lot is big text. Then the next page is small text. Then it goes to big text. So it's uh, it's confusing. That much I will let you into the secret. How quiet the place seemed after the everlasting murmur of voices and the hallooing trams of Torquay. And yet the quiet was many degrees removed from silence. Literary townsmen all seemed to fall into this one... Literary townsmen all seemed to fall into this one mistake. They praised the country for many virtues, but for none more than its beauty and, as one of them has it, its healing silence. But the truth is that the country quiet owes its beauty and its charm of quelling nervous unrest not to its silence, but to its living, dim, unceasing sound. If you ever achieve 
absolute silence, it will not soothe you but terrify you, for you will find unbroken silence only in the midst of prevalent death. Nature abhors silence almost as much as she does the vacuum. In the whole year's round, perhaps there is no moment of the night or day utterly bereft of sound, unless it be the starless, windless gloom of midnight at the season of the great frost. While there is moving air or water, there can never be true silence. But on these bitter, iron-bound nights, something very like the silence of death falls upon everything. Stand on such a night in the depths of the wood, or in some wild, open place far from any town or human settlement, then, then, though the keenest ear will hardly detect a sound, see if there be any beautiful or healing influence around you. Yet, for wild nature at least, death as well as life has its own telling signal. When the great frost has held for many weeks, locking up the food supply of the birds and bringing them face to face with starvation, it is nearly always on nights such as these that the last breach is made in the citadel. On midnight walks in the woodland at such a time, you will often hear a dull thud on the frozen ground, and it means that one more feathered creature has given up the fight, dying where it perched in the scanty shelter overhead. That eerie sound of death, familiar on so many solitary winter walks in time gone by, was brought back to me with a strange intensity as I sat on that gate in the sunshine of the quiet October morning, waiting for my net next host a wheel. Far behind me in the dense apple wood I heard something fall, with a sound curiously like that made by a half-frozen body of a dead thrush in winter. Another such sound followed almost immediately, and then another, and this time close at hand, and a great ruddy apple came bowling over the grass almost to my feet. These were not windfalls. For the moment, hardly a leaf stirred in the green roof of the wood. It was but nature finishing the work she had begun in April blossom time and casting the dead ripe fruit to earth where more creatures could get at it to liberate its seed than was possible up there in the laden boughs. Oh my God, here we go. This is the next page. If they don't scan them, look, look, look. I've got to read it like this now. Looking down, I saw that the apple full something round at all other parts was shrunken and deeply pitted on one side. That was where the bee, in her haste, had passed by one of the five pistols in the apple flower, leaving it unfructified. And so the fruit had grown lopsided and incomplete. It would have been one of the finest and largest apples on the tree, but for this unfortunate accident. As it was, it was fit for little else than the crushing mill. In the tree above me I could see that there are hundreds more just like it. All alike had stood in the same fair way to perfection. Then the winged marauders from the hives had come chanting through the sun and air of the April morning. But there were not bees enough for the work in the fruit-bearing district that I know of in the land. Sorry, just trying to get the sentences there. But there were not bees enough for the work. In no fruit-bearing district that I know of in the land, in the land, there are enough bees kept. Good apples are almost as much a product of the hives as honey itself, if only fruit goers, growers would be brought to realise it. Where were the bees now? I wondered, sitting on the gate and watching the blue tobacco smoke drift idly away on the veering air. Farther up the lane I could see an old barn with its roof, but all hidden under a dense can canopy of ivy, and at the thought I got down and strolled towards it. As I drew near, the murmur that had reached me by the gate grew to an uproar of insect noises, 
The whole great mass of ivy was smothered in minute golden blossoms, the nectar of each glistening in the vivid light. Here were bees, thousands of them, not indeed working with the frantic energy of summer, but busy enough in the mature, deliberate, autumnal way. And there were not and and there were not only hive bees, but almost every other winged atom in creation carousing at the ivy feast. Horse-voiced bumblebees, butterflies, blue bottles, innumerable yellow, innumerable, yellow barred, piratical, 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 piratical. How do you say the, what's, nobody's commenting, I don't know whether that's working, or are you just all listening. Um, piratical, is it? For pirates? Py piratical, piratical. Uh, piratical looking wasps and scrambling crane flies, literally by the thousand. And amidst all these, a jostling crowd of nameless creatures of all sizes and hues taking their fill of sweets, eager to get all they could of this, the last outdoor banquet of the year. But I only had a moment or two to watch them. The grinding of heavy wheels, wheels became suddenly the dominant note of the morning, and round the bend in the lane came a wagon and team whose driver cracked his whip merrily as he approached. I'm assuming, I, without a comment on there, I assume that you're there. I'm not just talking to myself. I'm having a lovely time, by the way. What was that message? It's got a strange message there um let's have a look the wagon was full of apples tons of them apparently of every color and degree of ripeness and on the top of the heap sat the wagoner a lanky tow-headed youth with a plume of purple heather in his cap the wagon moved so slowly that the boy and I were able to exchange greetings and other wayfaring amenities well within the time the jingling team took to saunter by. Where are you going with all those apples? I asked him. He had a soft, lazy South De Devon accent to perfection. Hardly opening his lips, he let the words roll about in his mouth as though they were sugar plums. There are lots of comments. I can't see any comments. Oh, I can't see any comments at all. Oh. Now I'm being phoned. Get rid of that on the live show. Um, oh, right. Oh, hang on. Hang on. I've just somehow I must have. Yeah, sorry. The, the, the comments must have just died. Let's have a look. Why is Richard reading off a screen? Says Nigel Sadler, hello. Uh, I'm reading because I haven't got the book, so I'm reading it off. None of the problems with paper book keeps working during a power cut too. Yes, I know. Uh, they didn't crop the scans down. Uh, he hasn't a physical copy. Oh, yes, that's right. It's marvellous reading, in my opinion. Reading off a screen with a different font heights and lines at different angles. Pirat piratic piratical. Piratical. Thank you. Uh, hope he doesn't get a sore neck. So do I. Don't think much of the scanning. Uh, I think I am self-obsessed cerebral diarrhoea. OK. We're here. Uh, just here to say hello in passing. Andrew Norris will catch up a bit later. So I think, yes. Oh, good. People are loving this. It just, it, I, for some reason, it completely stopped. And um, of course, I just didn't know anybody was there. But I just thought I'd keep going, see what happens. Um, I'm glad we're there. I don't know what that phone call was. It could have been for me, but it could have been anything. So I thought I better not. I didn't recognise the number. If it was you, one of you guys, thank you very much. Um, right, we're back in. How are we doing? We've got a few more minutes, so let's let's go. H uh, hardly opening his lips, he let the words roll about his mouth as though they were sugar plums. So where are you taking those apples? Was the question. Home, he said, pointing across the country with his whip. To Thrushleton, for cider making, us grows a powder of em, and us buys a sight more. These be from Stoke yonder, tis the third load since the sun up. Did never you see cider made? What? Never? 
Well, come along with me. A moment more, and I had mounted his side at this ready invitation and was off to Thrushleton, wherever that might be, to see the cider mill at work. That's what I... This is the sort of thing... I mean, it wouldn't happen now, would it? But that would be the sort of thing I would love to be doing with the bald explorer wandering along the road and someone goes, What? You've never seen apple cider in me? Oh, you come with me, little fella there, bald man with glasses. You come up here with your camera and microphone. We'll show you a thing or two as we did it down there in, 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 in Davern, see? Whether my experience that day was typical of farmhouse cider making in, in Devonshire or whether I had the misfortune only to come upon an aspect of it, rare as it was bad, I'm bound to say that I left the cider farm profoundly disillusioned as to many things. Above all, I could not help being struck by the squalid, not to say disgusting, surroundings in which the work was carried on. Thrushleton proved to be not very far, half an hour steady going over the hill and dale through the interminable apple woods brought us into the midst of thatched roofs and we stopped at the gate of a farmyard. The whole merry space was littered with straw, knee deep in which stood a herd of cows contentedly chewing. Pigs and poultry of all kinds wallowed and scratched in the filth dark puddles lay about everywhere, from which the sun drew up a sickly stench. Our wagon was squelching through it all and pulled up at the side of a building which proved to be the cider factory. Here the apples were shovelled in through a big window in the loft, where more shovelling brought them to a great funnel in the floor, whence they descended into the crushing machinery in the lower storey. Hard and hot work it was, and needing many hands. Half a dozen men were engaged on it, striped, stripped to their shirts. I watched them for a while, and then my curiosity aroused by the deep rumbling and clanking that came from below, I got down to explore the under-region of the place. It was no easy matter to pick a clean way through the mud and sodden litter of the yard, but I got round to the main door at last. The building was partly underground, and being lit only by a few small slits in the wall, and these almost entirely obscured by cobwebs. It was some time before I could discover what was going on. At last I made out an old horse tramping wearily round a centre post, and some dung-coloured, unsavoury-looking matter, which I guess to be the crushed apples, dribbling through the funnel in the ceiling and slopping down into a big vat below. There were several men there packing the stuff into horsehair bags, which in turn were stacked one over the other in the... waiting for the... <laughs> waiting now for the load loading to come up. Oh, come on into the cider press, and from this press flowed continuous liquid, dark, sludgy, and altogether of a most uninviting appearance. For some minutes I stood in my corner, dazed by the gloom, the noise, the busy reverberations of voices, and wondering if this was really typical of Devonshire cider-making. Years ago in the Valley of the Rhine, I had watched the grape harvesting and followed the dripping, fragrant wagons to the wine press, the horses garland in bright dahlias as though for a public holiday. But I'd never gone inside and seen the crushers at work. Perhaps if I had, much of the same disillusionment would have come to me as it did on that day in the Devonshire cider farm. I quickly got tired of the turmoil and darkness and heavy sweet ma miasma of the place, and retracing my way through the soggy yard, was soon on the road again, glad enough to be out once more in the pure air and untrammeled light. I have a feeling that's the end of that chapter. Yes, it is. So that's chapter one, ladies and gentlemen, and we will finish there. We will be on chapter two next time. Um, hmm. 
I was just getting into that. I think I'm getting into the the rhythm of the writer. Um, it sometimes takes me it takes me a while just to get into the rhythm of it, but I'm I actually am quite enjoying it. I hope you're enjoying it. Interesting um, book. K Dean says hello, Richard and lovely Julia and everyone just joined in. Happy to get alive. Lovely to have you here. Um, what else have we got? Have I missed uh, a few things? May well have done. Hello to Andrew, says Mike Stevens. Turbo Stream, it looks a good book so far. It does happen only with camper vans. Uh, Mike Stevens says there can be ye old scrumpy if thee knows where to ask. That sludgy stuff sounds pretty typical of any cider making to me. Do you know, I, th I, think, I think that's pretty... Um, typical of what it probably was like uh i think now of course we look at it would we'd be even more horrified with the uh, health and safety and stainless steel that we have um deborah warren enjoyed that thank you my pleasure um so we'll be back again tomorrow same time and we'll go with chapter two in which uh we get the motor man a wild flight of speculations in Exeter, London and Div Div Divonians on the furniture van, I reach oh, Colompton for the night. Colompton. Colompton. Is that a place? That doesn't sound like a real place, but it may be. Um, so they're hard to actually fathom where he is, but uh, we might have to uh, look on the maps and see if we can follow him a bit next time but there we go hope you enjoyed that thank you for joining me um no point trying to get keep going to make up the full hour because i think it's just nice to if the if they're like this and we can get one chapter an hour then that's great i made myself very ill says linda kane on cider back in the day no way could i drink it now no it can be a bit dodgy can't it same vobes same time same channel yes um columpton is a place fantastic Thanks, Richard. Better than the audiobooks and Jack and Ori. Oh, you're a very nice person, uh, bogus job seeker. Uh, thank you. Bye for now. Great rest of the day. Lovely reading. Thanks, Richard. Dulcet tones. Yeah, I, I'm getting into it. So I think tomorrow it's just finding the rhythm. Every author writes in a slightly different rhythm and I read it in a different way and it just takes a bit of time. And um, it, it's it's great when you get into it because you lose yourself and I'm not worried about the words. And then every now and again, there's a word that I know the word and I can't for some reason, I can't pronounce it. It's whereas if it had just popped into my head, I don't know, there's something that must I must have got some, you know, one of these vague conditions that you look at a word and you just go, oh, I don't know what that is. And then suddenly you go, oh, yes, I know what it is happens all the time it's like every time i see see the word um male, male, malevolent i always see it as male factor that's not even the right word is it malevolent <laughs> M male which one is that ma, 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 see i can't if i male male violent that's what i meant to say male violent malevolent but when I see it written down, I just cannot help breaking it into two words, which is what it is in a way, but it isn't how it's pronounced. Malevolent is malevolent. But I'll just see those two words, male factor, uh, male violent. And I'll, I'll, I'll read it that way. It's just bizarre. And you try and just train yourself to, to do it. Anyway. Uh, it's great to have you back, Richard, reading, and I'm loving the videos on your travels. Thank you very much. Anyway, take care. Better go, um, and I will catch up with you next time. Until then, look after yourselves. Have a good evening. Bye-bye for now. Yeah, mail. Oh, mail factor. That is a world, is it? But how is that? M m is that? That's not malevolent. M m is mail factor? Is that a word? Uh, no, it's a word. Oh, I'm going. I'm going. I'm going to embarrass myself. Till next time. Bye-bye.